Hey, welcome to another episode of the Black Guy Who Tips podcast. I'm your host, Rod, joined as always by my co-host, Karen. Inward Black with another episode of the Black Guy Who Tips podcast. Find us everywhere you get podcasts. Search the Black Guy Who Tips. We'll come up. Mm -hmm. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts, which you can now find on the web. You don't need to have the app or an iPhone. Mm, so no excuses if yeah. you was like, Apple ain't my thing. Y'all Samsung, Android phone people, y'all owe us. Come give us them five stars. Yeah, no more do. excuses. That you're Right. That's been the excuse. I don't want no more excuses. You can All go right. to the web. Uh, the official weapon of the show is... Bowden chair. An unofficial sport. What about? A bullet ball. Extreme. 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 Uh, Karen, do you have any banter? I do. All right. Do you have any banter? Sounds <laughs> Do you have any? Do you have any answer? 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 Do you have any answer? Talk to me. Do you have any banter? Banter? All right, Karen. My banter is this i've been seeing tanahasi coats. coats uh clips like you know i haven't really been clicked on been doing interviews he has a new book out yes and i've been seeing it kind of floating around yeah. you know people have all types of paint their paints a little bit everywhere mm -hmm. and so i was like you know what let me get the book and i i love y'all i love a good audio book and i love audio books where where the person has their own voice right. so his book came out i want to say yesterday day before yesterday and it's on audible and it's in his own voice you know because sometimes artists do things and it's called the message if anybody wants to know it's the message by tana his most recent book just came out and so um i wanted to uh i have not read any of any of his prior books but everybody who reads his work from what i from from my circle of friends loves his work so i said you know what? i'm gonna sit down and i'm going to actually uh do it on audible it's about a five five hour mm -hmm. listen so it's not even a full day's work like if you just sit down through the whole yeah. thing i didn't act because i was doing a lot of different things today i didn't actually get to like listen to the whole complete thing mm -hmm. but i had uh, a credit so i i used yeah. my credit this month on that and what i realized about the first ones that i've been list the first uh like think they do the intro then they go into the chapter so i'm like mm -hmm. chapter one parsing in chapter two this what i've realized so far he has a way with words mm -hmm. and just the way he described things and he's very elegant and very complex yet simplified in what he says where you can understand it um, from from what I've been hearing so far, he was talking about how he fell in love with writing through rap. He was saying like he he's always you know writing his and and stuff has been in him, but he was saying when he started listening to rap and he realized that people were writing to a beat and all that stuff, and he and something he something he said I got two quotes that I want to quote and then that that basically be my whole thing. He says. It's never enough for the reader to be convinced. But the goal of writing is to haunt, to have them think, to have them think about your words before bed, to see them manifesting in, in their dreams. And I really thought about what he said. And I was like, I understand that because like, if you're writing, particularly the types of writing that he writes, because he talked about how, re, how, how he read a Sports Illustrated about an older football player and that this particular uh, football player ended up uh, being injured and like out of the league. And he was saying how he read it and he just wanted to turn away, but he was like something in him just caused him to continue to read it. And he was saying that he's realized like, hey, when you write stuff, and you want your stuff to manifest with the reader, like you have to make it to where that person just grasps and just almost almost like soaks and envelops themselves in it. And I was like, man, 
Like I've I've never really thought of writing like that, but that's kind of what writing does to people, particularly if it's something that hits home or something that you care about or something that moves you in whatever way that it moves you, be it racial, be it, you know, in a song, whatever it is, because words have to be written for the person to sing them. And so it's really mean something to me is that you know you want to write something to where they go out and they tell other people you got to read this you got to read this like 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 just and just share it because it means so much to them that they almost can't keep it to themselves even if they want it to because they're just so excited about sharing these things that you have written yeah i definitely you know as a person that definitely believes in the power of the written word um i would even say uh it extends to uh pretty much all media you know, as a child of hip hop, mostly hip hop for myself, I that is the music that I glommed on to for some reason more harder than any other music. Um, and so I definitely feel that even when we do the podcast, even when I write for comedy, even when I wrote prose, uh, definitely feel the influences there because it's the way like certain lyrics live with you for the rest of your life. And it's just, you know, and I know for a lot of people, you know, that song lyrics is when they hear lyrics, but I'm rap lyrics are bars are what live with me for the rest of my life. You know, I never sleep. Sleep is a cousin of death. That's something I think all the fucking time. And it's why does that line stick out to me? I don't know, but it just does uh, constantly, you know? And so I think, um, yeah, I, I totally feel him on that. It's one of the reasons I like him so much as a writer is one, you know, I've been reading his books for years um and uh also because he was he had an unorthodox path uh path to to this uh prominence mm -hmm. that many people for different reasons did not really respect they did not and you know there's still people that make um academic arguments against him all the time i, I i'm not saying that you know I, he's a writer but he's a human so i don't think it's like if you don't agree with everything he says, you're a piece of shit. Like he says stuff sometimes where I'm like, eh. But he he goes back and and talks about those things that he said with different perspective as years past. Um, you know, I'm thinking specifically of some of the stuff he said about like Obama and whatnot. Um, and he's been pushed and challenged to become like an internationalist, something that um I don't I think he was not uh many years ago, but now he kind of has come into that from honestly from his boundaries being expanded um from getting that macarthur grant from being able to travel being able to see the world um i was i honestly even though i'm sure he uh you know he had a lot of misgivings with it but through social media making him aware of certain things he's one of his most he's probably his most rigorous critic and interrogationist when it comes to his own points of view which is uh something that's very difficult for people to do and um it's admirable i th i think I, I i don't really have a lot of um reverence for people who just stick to stuff when i think they're wrong new information comes in you learn something new or you just see a different perspective and you just see whether it increases the things you already believe and gives them a complexity they didn't have before or whether you say some you see something and you go oh i was just wrong i did i had this this i was looking at this in a different way um, I those are the things I like about him, and I, I will be getting his new book on Kendall, I'm sure. Yeah, and the the second uh, one, he was talking about the different forms, different forms of writing. Mm -hmm. He was saying you can't logic your way through it, or retreat to your inner genius. Genius may or may not help a writer whose job is above all else is for it. I, I go this right. Mm -hmm. My, Genius may or may not help a writer whose job above all else is to clarify. And then he went on, you know, to say, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with being genius, he say. But what he's realized is that when he talks to people, you know, not everybody, but people who call himself genius, he say, it's not always a good thing. He say they can put themselves in a light, but they also can put themselves in a box, too. Mm -hmm. Because whatever their mind says it is, that's what it is. Because th because they're the genius. Yeah, and we put that weight on people. 
it's why people are so afraid of the word genius and hesitant to give it out is because we didn't put the people on a pedestal and make it seem like, well, whatever the genius thinks is obviously correct. And to me that, you know, that's kind of like a very simplistic way of looking at anything. You know, Kanye West could be a musical genius. I don't find the idea of genius, talent, whatever. I don't find that so reprehensible or lofty to a point where we should not grant it to anybody i, I actually low-key kind of hate how we utilize the word you know i've talked about it before when someone would get upset that like oh people keep calling donald glover genius and i'm like what's wrong with that right i don't understand is it not you see the work he's put out you see how multifaceted and talented he is there are that is not something everyone can do that is just not. I'm, right. I'm sorry that you, you know, you, I'm sure you at home think you got all the answers to shit. Go try it. The motherfucker is making masterful music and then he's making masterful TV and then he's playing uh, parts masterfully. I have to give him his credit where it's due. Right. What happens is that people then, um, this is the same thing I have with Kayla Clark. People get resentful of who has the privilege of having that bestowed upon them. So then you feel like you need to take it away. You don't see it as, no, 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 it needs to be added. This label should be added to other people, you know? So when we did that show about, you know, Donald Glover, and then I'm like, yeah, but also it doesn't bother me because I see Beyonce as a genius. I, I see too. Rihanna as a genius. Same. Um, especially like marketing wise and stuff. I don't really, I'm not waiting for anyone's validation or confirmation on that. I, this is not a group project I, this is what i think you don't have to agree with me you can be like i don't think donald glover or anybody you mentioned is genius it's reserved for einstein or whatever that's cool um but i do like the idea of i think you're right you can retreat into that box and becomes it becomes like this self-justifying thing of like well everyone calls me a genius so i don't need to consult anyone i don't need to learn anything how i feel is right I, um, uh, in the beginning of what you said about to clarify, um, I think about this a lot with the show. I think about this a lot in life. If an idea is only as good as it can be communicated, right? If I can't communicate my idea, all the righteous anger, all the correctness, all the it just does not matter. It falls flat. The idea becomes infectious by the ability to be communicated. That's how change happens it doesn't change unless i can relay it to you in a way that you could relay it to someone else um you know i i think some people i mean i don't know what they're thinking I, no one's ever really confronted me about this but you know i remember regretting saying uh black men are the white people of black people or something like that mm -hmm. and a lot of people are like but you was right why would you say that and i said because the way that it sparked so much misunderstanding, mm -hmm. I have to own that I could have, I, I communicated in a shocking way, not in a way that I feel was wrong, but in a, it, 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 I said it in an inflammatory way to shock the system, to get brothers to be like, damn, we really can be abusive of our privilege within our intra-community discussions. I, I brought it up on the podcast, talked about it at length many times. Um, but if you just see that tweet and your first thing is thinking I'm, you know, I hate black men, I I that I uh think white men and and black men are the same amount of privilege and all of this stuff, it does a disservice to the idea because you just got defensive and the fucking idea never lands with you. And right. there's no amount of explaining I'm going to be able to do to bring that moment back to where I could have slow walked you up to the point of because it's not just a black man thing. All mm -hmm. men have privilege in Amer in the world within their intra community dynamics compared to the women, the uh, LGBTQ people, and the children in most of these societies. Right. I could have communicated it just like that. Now, what would have happened if I typed all that? I wouldn't have got no no retweets. It you wouldn't know, have got no likes. It wouldn't have got no care. faves. Nobody would have shared it. Most people would have been able to agree. Even the brothers who got mad at me would have been like, well, yeah, that we do have some privileges, period, even if you're black. That it's not necessarily the same as what a white man would have. But yes, I can I can cop to there's some things that when you're a black dude, 
people give you a pass on that you wouldn't if you were a black woman. You know, may, and not every man, but some of them would have. Right. So I have to take the L because I did not communicate that properly and just ended up in a spiral for days arguing with motherfuckers I've never, never met, never will meet, strangers. Some people take making bad faith arguments. Um, never had that. Never had that problem with the podcast though. Mm-mm. I've expressed the same idea on the podcast. It's long form, but it's long form, and it reminds me of why Coach got off of social media. Yep. Because, because he's a long form, he's a thinker. long form essayist and thinker, mm-hmm. and social media is full of bad faith, hot flash in the pan, quick. Like it rewards flatness, it rewards quickness, in a way that is disruptive to that form of thinking. And some of these more complicated ideas need the runway. Yes, you need the runway to take it off. You can't just, you can't just go zero to flying in the air in a sec in 140 characters. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, um, that's how, yeah, I agree with all that. Yeah. And like, and like I said, I just started, like I said, I'm about chapter two. Yeah. About, mm-hmm. about to hit chapter two. And so, like I said, this is my first time actually sitting down with his work. And those are like two phrases that, I mean, two passages that kind of stuck out to me. So I kind of typed them down. So I would remember that. That's interesting that you got this book because normally you're just, you get like autobiographies of comedians, which is mostly mm-hmm. just, in my opinion, a lot of those are just kind of stand up, but in a book format. There's mm-hmm. a lot of bits and shit and uh, jokes and whatnot. Nothing's wrong with that. Mm-hmm. I, I just, you know, I think people use reading as escapism. It's kind of light fair to be like, mm-hmm. let's see what Tiffany Haddish got to say. Let's see what Lil Rel has to say. You know, those kind of like books that are ghost written or they sit down with a person that records a bunch of interviews and then they make it into a book. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting to see you take on something that uh, to me is a bit more substantial. I don't, I don't even know that you do much. Uh, this is your first book like this. I think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and, and also I think, <laughs> how can I say this for me? Um, because I know that, and now he also talked about in the book when you talk about him being an internationalist, he had, he's recently done a bunch of traveling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so he talks about the break between his last book and this book and why it took him so long. And, you know, he was talking about the various different places, which I know he's probably going to go into further down in the book. So with, I was like, oh, so you went to Palestine and you went to Israel. Like, like, so I was so, and, and with the, with him doing these interviews and everybody's kind of been talking about it. I was like, you know what? It sounds like he's a very smart and intellectual man. And for people to kind of do these interviews with him where they're kind of attacking him and he's answering very smoothly and they don't know how to handle him because he's not, he's not coming at you with the fire. He's like, no, it is what it is. I think that those people off because like you say, social media and even the media, everything is fight, 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 hot take, hot take, fight, fight type of thing. He's like, well, you know what's interesting? The interview I think you're talking about, I'll play some for everybody. The one on the uh, CBS Mornings, that's not a place for fight, fight, fight. Which makes it even more strange that there, it was so much animosity thrown his way from um, the one of the hosts. Uh, that's really like a layup situation. Basically, like, we like this guy. He's got a book coming out. It's about some serious stuff banter 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 and then tell them where to go get the book those are what those interviews are half the right. time they don't even fucking read the books if we're being honest probably more than that they probably get a get, get something that uh, uh yeah they get a little a little, summary. little press kit that tells them like here are the questions to ask and stuff mm-hmm. but in this case i think the last third of this book is about is really heavy on palestine and obviously we've talked about the conflict uh in uh with Palestine, Gaza, Israel, it's only gotten worse in my opinion. I don't know what can be done. I don't think um, there's any feasible thing that American voters have on the table that will solve, resolve this conflict. I'm not even sure America could, if we're being honest. Same. Um, but I know that there's things that could be go- done, like, you know, cutting off arms uh, of, of all types of aid and stuff. But then there's a whole nother kit and caboodle with the repercussions of that. Like the, I think liberal people and people that just, you know, consciously see this suffering and want it to end. Um, for us, 
it's pretty easy. Like we don't have much in this fight and we don't necessarily know all the history. Right. And we don't necessarily feel like we have to know all the history. That's I'm not saying that's fair to people that do know that history, that have lived that history. Right. But I know for a lot of us, it's like, well, I, at this point, I don't even really see where the where the back and forth is. It just seems like a one-sided humanitarian crisis that is killing people who literally had nothing to do with the shit at this point. Like, not all, like it, it. And at this point, there's Israelis being killed by Israeli bullets and shit. Like, it's not. This is not some simple ass like. Uh, well, well, we gonna keep we gonna keep going today. Stop going, and a lot of this is because Benjamin Netanyahu is in charge. You have a lot of um, Israeli Israeli people who are anti how far he's gone. Mm-hmm. People who probably were like, "Listen, we understand there must be retaliation, there must be defense for October 7th. but like literally, people marching in the street, like not for not this. Like it's like at this point, it's a humanitarian thing. It's not just an Israel Palestine thing, right? But uh, Coates went and saw for himself, uh, which people encourage you to do. And uh, the one of the hosts, I don't know his name, I believe he is Jewish, kind of goes off on him. Um, I'll see if I can kind of fast forward to New York Times. Um, let's see. Uh, but he almost like immediately goes off. Um, the section of the book's the largest section. Of the- All right, here we go. Well, which policies we don't are actually shaped largely by writing and the stories we tell. And so I believe that writers, and particularly young writers, have so much to do in the politics and in this time when, you know, obviously we have so much conflict and there's so many quote-unquote issues to mm. be dealt with. Tanahashi, I want to dive into the uh, Israel-Palestine section of the book. It's the largest section of the book. Mm. And I have to say, when I, when I read the book, I imagine if I took your name out of it, took away the awards and the acclaim, took the cover off the book, the publishing house goes away, the content of that section mm. would not be out of place in the backpack of an extremist. Mm. And so then I found myself wondering, why does Tanahashi Coates, who I've known for a long time, read his work for a long time, very talented, smart guy, leave out so much? Mm. Why leave out that Israel is surrounded by countries that want to eliminate it? Why leave out that Israel deals with terror groups that want to eliminate it? Mm. Why not detail anything of the first and the second intifada, the cafe bombings, the bus bombings, Mm. the little kids blown to bits? And is it because you just don't believe that Israel in any condition has a right to exist? Mm, mm, mm. Well, I was. So that question is a very loaded question. Yes. Off top. It's essentially accusing him of aligning and making, creating terrorist propaganda. Now, look, I haven't read the book. Karen has probably hasn't gotten to this part yet. Mm-hmm. He says the last third of the book. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to read this and be like, God damn, this is terrorist propaganda. But I'm guessing I'm not just because Coase is pretty reasonable. Um, and I've heard him talk about this before in interviews when he first got back from mm-hmm. visiting uh, Palestine and the Gaza Strip and whatnot. And so I would imagine that he's just making a humanitarian plea for the plight of these people who he can easily identify with because black people in America have experienced a certain level of um, a- oppression, apartheid, um and all of this stuff. And so it is easy for us to see someone, someone's plight and connect with it, even if it's not a one-to-one like comparison, right? Right. Um, There was, but I always thought the most interesting thing he said in his interviews when he got back was not actually just the identifying with the Palestinians, which I I thought was, you know, I've I've seen people make that argument many times as black people. and and you know it got fraught after uh Kamala Harris came to the fore uh because TikTok the alliance between like the Palestinian influencers and black influencers really fell apart over that shit because mm-hmm. I mean, there's black people that finally were able to be like uh if I have a chance to have a black president who will be better for black people in America I'm going to vote for them right even if I don't know that they'll be that much better than Biden is in the Middle East. And there's people that still are mad about that shit. And I, I, I've seen some really nasty shit that people have said about each other. I'm not sharing it on the show, but just stuff that I'm like, this can't be helping anybody. Mm-mm. But um, the message that I thought he was interesting, I don't know if it's in the book, but it was when he actually talked about 
black people being able to relate to Israel as well. Like what if, cause Israel, obviously Jewish people have faced tremendous oppression, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and discrimination and literally like j- attempted genocide of the entire race of Jewish people. Black people know something about that. I think that too. it's one of the reasons that black and Jewish people have an alliance in America for the most part. Um, and it's being tested, but the thing he said was like, it made him think what if black people had been afforded the power that Coates himself seemed to covet for years in his writing. Like, like this was where America fucked us. It's like we needed a right to protect ourselves and to do this and to do that. But when trauma is speaking, which it would have been, and you give trauma a blank check and all the guns, child, it's a mess. Trauma's not always the best um, adjudicator of what is justice, what is enough, what is protection, what is defense. Right. Because if you've been traumatized, offense feels like defense. You know, I'm not letting this happen to me again. Mm-hmm. I will fucking wipe you off the map. I'll kill all of you yes. before I allow anything else to happen to me. Mm-hmm. And while I, it's an understandable, empathetic thing to go through, it it can lead people. We've all seen it happen in per, interpersonal stuff. Like, let's yes. take away the macro, go to the micro. All of us know somebody that jumps to 12 where we're like, whoa, I didn't even say that. What are you talking about? Yes. And it's like, well, no, someone said something to me like that. Someone hit me before. Someone did whatever, and I'm not letting it happen again. So you came in the house and slammed the door too loud. I'm going to fuck off. And it's like, I slammed the door by accident. I didn't mean to do it. Well, the last person slammed it on purpose on my foot. So I'm going to fuck you up. And I think, you know, not that's a harsh analogy or whatever, but I but think yeah. that is kind of the situation. And I did appreciate that part of his analogy. And I, I hope it made the book because this man is, and this man who obviously is biased himself, this man makes it sound like the Tanazi Coast is like, fuck Israel. They right. it didn't even exist. Not trying to find it. I, the, from the beginning, I was like, I doubt that's what that man yeah. said. Yeah, but Coast does ask for him. Let's say the perspective that you just outlined, um, there is no shortage of that perspective in American media. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Um, I am most concerned always with those who don't have a voice, with those who don't have the ability to talk. Um, I have asked repeatedly in my interviews <clears throat> whether there is a single network mainstream organization in America with a Palestinian American bureau chief or correspondent who actually has a voice to articulate their part of the world. Um, I've been a reporter for 20 years. Um, the reporters of those who believe more sympathetically about Israel um, and its right to exist don't have a problem getting their voice out. But what I saw in Palestine, what I saw on the West Bank, What I saw in Haifa in Israel, what I saw in the South Hebron Hills, those were the stories that I have not heard. And those were the stories that I was most occupied with. I wrote a 260 page book. It is not uh, a treatise on the entirety of the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. But if you were to read this book, you would be left wondering, why does any of Israel exist? What a horrific place committing horrific acts on a daily basis. So I think the question is central and key. if Israel has a right to exist? And if your answer is no, then I guess the question becomes, why do the Palestinians have a right to exist? Why do 20 different Muslims? He never said no. He didn't, but the this interviewer is trying to frame this into a, he's trying to pigeonhole him into saying something that is anti-Semitic. Essentially you say Israel does not have a right to exist which of course is a trigger like it's, mm-hmm. it's and this is one of the reasons that honestly a lot of black people in america a lot of people in america that aren't jewish do not they're f- afraid to talk about these things is because there's certain triggers in this that if you're not steeped in the culture if you're not steeped in the rhetoric of the also the anti the, the anti-semitism you can say something that sounds just as anti-semitic you know i remember uh Mark Lamont Hill, who's famous for putting his foot in his mouth many times. But I remember when he got like suspended or kicked off of uh, MSNBC or one of those networks because he said they were going to uh, take back Israel from the river to the sea. And the river, that means something. Like that's not a 
unloaded term. I don't know what the fuck that means. Me I'm not steeped in it. I learned because he said something and everybody was like, whoa, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? And so I think a lot of people have been scared to even say like, yo, what is happening doesn't seem right. Right. The, what is happening to the Palestinian people feels very familiar mm -hmm. to what I've seen that was injustice here. And and so instead, this, this man is like, so you trying to say Israel can't exist? Like, so that you'll go, yeah, it doesn't have a right to exist. And then you go, oh, you're fucking anti-Semitic. I knew it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why I think he was trying to do. Yes, that. And like you say, it's one of those things where this is trauma speaking. This is like, 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 and, and, and that's why a lot of people say, in my opinion, go, okay, I understand your pain. I understand what you've been through. I'd rather just stay away from those landmines and not talk about it and not discuss it. If anybody brings it up, I have no opinions. I have no feelings. Yeah. I don't care. People have been scared. Right, because it's like you say anything, the next thing you do, you lose all your money, your career, everything's getting quote unquote yanked from you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's not worth it for some shit that I may or may not know anything about. Yeah, um, but that's why he reacted almost as if Coach said, it doesn't have a right to exist just so he could keep going on this point. Right. He doesn't want to listen to him and actually go, okay, you didn't mm -hmm. say that. What are you saying? It's like, well, if you were, if you would have said that though. Some countries. My answer right is that no country in this world establishes its ability to exist through rights. Countries establish their ability to exist through force um, as America did. And so I think this question of right to Israel does exist. It's a fact. Uh, the question of its right is not a question that I would be faced with with any other country. But you write a book that delegitimizes the pillars of Israel. Yeah. It seems like an effort. I said, that's valid. Yeah. For the top of the whole building of it. So I, I come back to the question, and it's what I struggled with throughout this book. What is it that so particularly offends you about the existence of a Jewish state that is a Jewish safe place and not any of the other states out there? There's nothing that offends me about a Jewish state. I am offended by the idea of states built on ethnocracy, no matter where they are. Muslim. And that was a good answer, but also that question is also loaded because he assumes that it's honestly asinine to say to Tanasi Ta Coates, you don't have a problem with any other state existing. That then you just don't you then you just admit that you've never read or cared about anything else he's ever said, because I'd say the bulk of his work, his American work, is the problem with how America exists. And what it does, like that's just and that's just here. That's not just other countries. That's just what the how America works is fucked up. Right? Yes, that's very that's heavy. On pretty that. much the only thing he writes about. And then one time he wrote a fiction book, which if you're looking at that, is also about the same fucking thing. So to say <laughs> to say like, why you got a problem with Israel? You would never had this problem. He's a guy that has problems with shit. That's. That's, his claim to fame. That's he's, his thing. He's synonymous with, if he wrote a book, I promise you, he got a problem with some shit, okay? <laughs> yeah. Muslim included. I would not want a state where any group of people laid down their citizenship rights based on ethnicity. The country of Israel is a state in which half the population exists on one tier of citizenship, and everybody else that's ruled by Israelis exists on another tier, including Palestinian Israeli citizens. The only people that exist on that first tier are Israeli Jews. Why do we support that? Why, why is that okay? I'm the child of Jim Crow. I'm the child of people that were born into a country where that was exactly the case of American apartheid. I walk over there and I walk through the occupied territories and I walk down the street in Hebron. And a guy says to me, I can't walk down the street unless I profess my religion. Okay. I'm with Hold another path. No, 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 no. I want to. Uh, this yeah, is very, this, very it important. Is important. It it's is extremely important. Yeah, let me lay it down. I'm working with uh, the person that is guiding me. Is a Palestinian, whose father, whose grandfather and grandmother was born in this town, and I have more freedom to walk than he does. He can't ride on certain roads. He can't get water in the same way that Israeli citizens who live less than a mile away from him again. And why is, why that? is that okay? Why is that? Why, why is there no agency in this book for the Palestinians? They, they exist in your narrative merely as victims of the Israelis, as though they were not offered peace at any juncture, as though they don't have a stake in this as well. What is their role in the lack of a Palestinian? I have a very, 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 very moral compass about this. And again, perhaps it's because of my ancestry. Either apartheid is right or it's wrong. It's, it's, it's really, really simple. Either what I saw was right or it's wrong. I am, for instance, against the death penalty. What the person did to get the death penalty 
it really doesn't matter to me. I don't care if they were selling a nickel bag of marijuana or if they were a serial killer. I am against the death penalty. Mm. I am against a state that discriminates against people on the basis of ethnicity. I'm against that. There is nothing the Palestinians could do that would make that okay for me. My book is not based on the hyper morality What's the last of the Palestinian you want people. In lessons, because many people feel it's complicated. You say it's not complicated. Less than 20 seconds. What's your message? Less than 20 seconds. I want people to read the book. Well, yeah. And I don't make the assumption that somebody would just read the book and have written and have read nothing, nothing else, else about okay. Israel and Palestine. You're still invited to high holidays. I'll see you at the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he was trying to diffuse it at the end, um, even though that was kind of a weird thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a very aggressive interview um, right. for a morning show, especially. Uh, he very also heavy for morning shows because it's normally really light when you do those shows. It's like, hey, 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 kick, kick, kick. all right, read the book. On to the next segment. Yeah, and he also went on with the Daily Show with John Stewart, who's also, I believe, also Jewish, if I'm not mistaken. Um, matter of fact, let me look that up just to make sure. Um, but he went on on the Daily Show, um, and um, yeah, he's he's Jewish. He went on the Daily Show, and people were sharing that interview and being like, "Well, this this was with a Jewish person. This was much more." conciliatory and a much better interview than um, the one that happened on the morning, you know, CBS mornings. So I don't know that it's just a, all Jewish people are going to attack coach for this um, in the way that this man did. I'm sorry. I don't know his name. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's so I, it doesn't have, the conversation does not have to go the way that it went. No. Um, but you know, I, I think, what Coates is doing is something that is morally admirable, even if you disagree or think he's not giving everybody a complete picture of it. Um, and I guess we'll find out if, uh, you know, how people feel about it when that, once the book is out, my guess is this kind of goes away. Uh, like I really mm -hmm. think, I really think people are beyond um, caring. I, I hate to say that. I don't know I that agree. people are going to change much. Even if he makes the most compelling, relatable argument possible, I think a lot of people in academic circles will appreciate it and discuss it. But the long form consciousness of the the common person right. has been so stripped down to twenty second sound bites and headlines on articles that we don't read and clips that we take out of context and, and make our own content with. I don't even know that Tanasi Coates is able to reach the, the, the cultural zeitgeist in the way that uh, he would have even 10 years ago. Uh, here's some of the John Stewart. And listen, man, like, let's not kid ourselves. Once you delve into Israel Palestine, you're gonna take a ton of shit. I don't know where it's, it'll come from everywhere. And, and I hope you don't, uh, wear it personally, but you've done the most important can thing. I, can I just say one quick thing? Yes, please. It will not measure up to the burdens of what I saw Palestinians on the West Bank barrier. It's not even that's, that's, an, uh, uh, that's an excellent point. The only point I was going to make is through your discomfort, albeit not the same discomfort, you've done the most important thing, which is try to advance and delve into an understanding of a complexity that we haven't figured out in 10,000 years. And yeah. so I applaud that. And your writing, as always, is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's point being, it doesn't have to be this anim uh, this interview with animosity. Mm -mm. Like, there were ways to treat it that weren't just like, so you basically a terrorist, you know. Well, you can still come to the, to the high holidays. Don't worry about that. Like that, it was just kind of a weird thing, but yeah, we'll see yeah. what happens. Right, and also I think uh, for me, I, and also you kind of encouraged me to uh, get the audio book because I, I uh, recently read, for those of you who do the nerd off, I read Amulet. And Amulet is a scholastic book. It's a kid's book, but it's like a really, really long book. It's like, like nine, 10 books, which, which is like, Comic books that they condense into a book form. So they're graphic novels, they're very long. Go yes. Ahead. And so I have been reading them off and on. And so I sat down over the past, you know, maybe a week and just zoomed through them. And you was like, oh, you're reading a lot. And I thought about that. I was like, you know what? I have, e even though the comic book, it still requires yeah, a form reading. of reading. And so you really made me really think about that. And 
I, and I've talked about this before, but it's one of the things where I wanted to more challenge myself a little bit more. And like I said, even though it's audio book, it still counts. You don't have to downplay it. Right. It, uh, for me, it still gives you, it, how can I say it? it makes your, your brain tingle. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. It makes my brain tingle and tick and, 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 and and bounce all over the place just trying to dissect and and comprehend what I'm yeah, hearing. I, I read um Conflict is Not Abuse by Sarah Shulman, one of the best books I've ever read. Um, a book that I really wasn't ready for and that challenged me. And much in the way that you said about this coach thing when we started talking, that book haunted me. I remember starting that book and stopping that book early in the book and being like, fuck out of here. This is crazy. Uh, I don't agree with this. You know what I mean? Like, well, what is her? Because I was so caught up in like online, what the online currency and meaning of social justice and activism was. Meanwhile, this woman is a dyed in the wool activist. Like she is a out there, you know, like, like, like lesbian, like outspoken uh, person. And, um, and the last probably fourth of that book, the last few chapters is about Israel and how and and the oppression of Palestine, and this was I mean I, I must have read this book. It's been a while ago, eight nine years. I read this book a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I and, and I keep in mind I didn't feel like I'm so informed, guys. I come to me for the answer. I know how to fix this. I don't. I I'm sure when I get done reading coach shit, I won't feel like I know the fucking answer. Right. But the thing that the thing she said is what put it in perspective to me because the book is about how trauma makes people uh, react in, in inflammatory ways. And if we acquiesce to that, we call that justice, but sometimes that's not justice, right. you know, on an interpersonal level. It's, it's like when people say stuff like, Listen, we're going to have this group and we're going to listen to the person that is the most marginalized, oppressed person. And it's like, OK, and then we're going to make them the leader. OK, well, if that person is dealing with trauma and all this stuff and they and they're now in charge and they have the unlimited power and, not, and, and questioning them is considered um, discriminatory and racist or whatever ism you want to put on it. Mm -hmm. All we've done is install them as the new de facto person to reign over everybody. And I remember watching that happen on social media in a lot of places mm -hmm. and going like, and this is at the time when I was like, well, I guess this is what people want. And I guess this is right. But there was something in the back of my mind, like, no, because this person is wrong and y'all are only letting this be okay because they hit certain marks marginalization boxes check them boxes and, and then you let and then if someone says they're wrong you just call them isms so it's like if if uh it's like uh an example if um there this is hypothetical guys let's not say there was and this is a real group of people hypothetically let's say there was a group of women lgbtq women who started a movement that they or took credit for a movement that maybe they didn't start. Maybe somebody else started the movement, but they named the organization after the movement and they got a lot of credit for the movement and they started trying to control everybody that wasn't even part of their organization and being like, you can't do interviews. Don't go on the radio. Don't call yourself a leader. Don't organize protests. Only we should get the credit for that. And they're not even in the streets with you. They just deciding that, 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 they, that they should get to do that. Right. Well, if years fucking later, stuff comes out where it's like, yo, they have absconded with millions and millions of dollars. People don't know where the money went to. And some of the purchases that they've made are not these purchases that are seem to be benefiting community. But now, like some of their own coffers are are overflowing. Some of their own purchases for their personal products and and family members and and who divvy like these funds are going to these people and at a time when motherfuckers are still getting killed in the street and no one's organizing this shit anymore so what did the money do where did the money go to hypothetically if something crazy like that would have happened like like i'm not saying that did happen right but if you question it and go yeah what is up with that 
Oh, so you mean you hate LGBTQ black women and and that's your problem? No, that's not my problem at all. If it was Sean King, we wouldn't even be discussing. Sure no one's going to ask me if I have a problem with very, 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 very light skinned black men. No one's going to write in and be like, well, what's your problem? They're just going to go, yeah, where is the money? You know what I'm saying? So like there's there that did strike me as wrong. Mm -hmm. And it was reading that book that made me be like, yeah, I'm not I don't have to co-sign anything fucked up. Nope. Just to be like, well, hey, you can't question such and such group. Nah, if if you're fucked up, you're fucked up. It doesn't really matter. And, and that's still with a full recognition of the oppression, the mm -hmm. patriarchy. Not the, to be any of that from nobody. Yeah, it's not, I'm not a person that denies that. I'm not some right wing asshole who's like, I don't even know why they marching for black people. They deserve to be shot. I'm not a coon. I'm none of that. But I can say, yo, something is not clean in this milk. And and that shouldn't and if and if any movement, if any group can't hold up to that level of scrutiny or just that level of question, then then what the fuck are we doing? You know what I'm saying? So I feel you. Uh in, that was it for your banter? That was it, yeah. You well, now any? my banter is uh we've been talking for almost an hour, but oh. my banter was was not as substantial as this. Oh, I didn't realize I was gonna take us down that rabbit hole, baby. No, nah, no, nah, it's okay. I'm glad I did though. People wanted to hear it and all yeah, it's nobody's fault. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Should I even do it now? <laughs> you can. Like, uh, or I guess it's gonna sound sounds really stupid, but um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shout out to nosy ass cashiers at Publix. They are really, they really be in their bag and in my bag at Publix. These <laughs> these motherfuckers do not mind their business. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. It don't matter which fucking line I go to. Nope, it's something about it's like, you. It's like they're all doing stand-up routines. No. And the stand-up routine, by that, I mean crowd work. It's literally <laughs> just crowd work. I don't know if they do it with everybody or what. Movie. But like the, like the other day I went and there, I was by myself. And the, one of the people there is like talking about my food choice. Like, oh, what y'all cooking for dinner tonight? Oh, look like y'all gonna have some dinner. And they do this all the time. Like, I kind of want to put embarrassing items in my fucking <laughs> thing now. You see how they go respond to it? Even though I don't need it. I just want to put them in there. Be like, yeah, uh, I got um, a bunch of Magnum condoms and uh, some Blue Star ointment. Um... <laughs> Go ahead, ring that up and ask me what I'm getting for dinner, motherfucker. Like, it's just not your business. What happened to you just bloop, bloop, and then put it in the bag and we don't really need to do anything but exchange? What happened and, to the weather? What and, happened to that? As, as, put like this, as much as a goddamn talk I am, I was a cashier for years, and child, I was like, bloop, 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 bloop. I didn't give a fuck what you had. Bloop, 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 bloop. I just don't get it. Like, right. You know, like today, we went and Karen was all hugged up on me. Um, and she's want to do sometimes. Yes. Um, and I'm, I touchy touchy feel you. Mm -hmm. And so she's all hugged up on me and shit. And so the fucking lady at the register or whatever, who had weird conversation timing, um, she she first of all she paused at first for a second because I think Karen spoke to her. She didn't say nothing, but I think she was trying to build up to this big comedic <laughs> reaction. And she was like, she was like, um. Oh, uh, y'all need to wait till y'all get to the car before you do. If like, I don't mind y'all hugging up on each other, but you need to wait till you get to the car before you, uh, do anything extra. Ha 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 ha. And I'm like, ha ha, yeah. And I'm already putting my phone number in the thing, running my card to make this as fast <laughs> as possible. Uh, like I run my card before they ring my shit up. You should call it. You, my card is done. I'll be looking at them like, can you just hit the accept button? <laughs> you. Do. I know the money's in there. It's approved. Let's just get this shit over with. And so um, this woman is still doing her routine this whole time. And then she goes to me like, uh, uh, how you doing? And I was like, I'm doing good. And she's like, and how's your lovely wife? And I just looked at Karen like, well, she's right there. You can ask her. You know, like, I don't need, like, she's a woman. So I said, what you doing? But honestly, I think I threw her off when I did that. 
because I didn't say much. I just looked at Karen like, well, how you doing? And I think she thought for a second, oh, shit, this might not be his wife. Oh, oh. (laughs) And in that second, I wished I had lied and been like, ma'am, I don't even know this one. (laughs) Okay. You didn't see nothing. Lord, I'd I'd have been like the little kid in the grocery store when their parents were like, who is this kid? If you see me with another woman. I'd been like, sir. If you see me with another woman in here, you just pretend that that woman is my wife because you don't know us. And you don't, you didn't see nothing, and you need to mind your damn business. <laughs> I'd have been having a fit in the grocery store. Where you going? What if she? But 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 why are you taking this chance? What if you? What if I really was with my side chick? That's true too. What if yeah. somebody was with their side chick? That's none of your fucking business. Mm-hmm. And why would you even want to be involved at this point? Why are you taking this risk? Just ask people. It is a huge risk. Well, hey, nice weather we're having. That's it. Some That's it. Matter of fact, some weather we're having. That's all you need. That's all you got to say. You don't need all this extra like, hey, let me get in your business. So you got peanut allergy? Because I noticed you got the... <laughs> I know. So you make a booze lesson. So you make a banana pudding? I noticed you went for the Snickers. Uh, you didn't go for the Snickers. You went for the Milky Way. <laughs> then the last time somebody was like, oh, you make a banana pudding. And like one of the other cashiers, she was minding her business. She was just quiet. And the the other lady said something to her. She was like, I don't like banana put. I don't like bananas. I was like, how the fuck we get to you not liking bananas? Nobody gives a fuck you don't like bananas. Right. Like, what's this happening here? And it happens every fucking time. <laughs> now, I have to agree with what you on that one, baby. Happening? I like Like, that one I agree with. I was like, you know, the, okay, I make a banana pudding. Why? Why? Now, them talking to each other turned into a whole ass ordeal. <laughs> I was like, and, look. And the thing is, I I don't mind human interaction i right. don't i prefer to go to them than to the self checkout because i'm black and i'm worried that they gonna fucking pull that motherfucking stevie wonder on my ass and act like i snuck snuck crack out the fucking <laughs> store for some you know some book because they did i forgot to ring something up or i didn't know the right thing and then they're gonna be like those you bring those up as oranges but that is actually lobster and then i gotta go to prison and fucking Stevie Wonder's is a boy, a child is born, Mm-mm. and 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 now, I don't work here. You ring now I'm up. in prison and shit. So I'm like, I prefer to go to y'all because mm-hmm. y'all see the shit and y'all go ahead and do the fucking you know the thing, right? I'm not, but paid. I don't need this extra level. Like I'm not talking about you can't talk about the traffic. Like someone right. said, is it my introvert me fussing? No, it's the mind your motherfucking business talking. <laughs> like, and Ro- why are you taking these chances? I don't understand. Ro- keep it simple. Roger is like, hey, keep it simple. Ask me about the weather. Talk about right. the traffic. Once you start getting into like that, that personal interaction, you don't know what's happening we in are, people's lives. We are strangers to each other, right? What the fuck are you? What is happening? This is not normal. And I know the rest of you niggas aren't going to the store and they being like, oh, no, she got some tampons. You on your period? I know that y'all aren't okay with that. So stop bullshitting in the chat room and pretending that this shit is okay. It's actually not fucking okay. I see I see you bought some yeast infection medication. Hey. Somebody in the house got a yeast infection? Oh, Monistat. Oh, you went with the Monistat 7, not the Monistat 3. I guess uh, you got some time on your hands. All right. What the fuck is wrong with y'all? <laughs> Just mind your motherfucking business. What happened to, ooh, hot enough for you? I love a hot enough for you. Not enough hot enough for you in the world when it comes to motherfucking waiters and goddamn cashiers. We that, don't need that's me. a deep exchange. No, we, I, What's next? Hey, what do you think about Israel, Palestine? Boop. Boop, boop. You don't want to know and I don't want to know. No, do not. We don't need to add that shit to this conversation. I like them like pointless conversations. Child, we could do this all goddamn day. They gonna be ringing up. Oh, see, someone's doing some fucking tonight. Whoop. <laughs> you know they got the KY warming jelly on sale too. Don't just go with the regular KY. My personal favorite. I did not need to. What is happening here? Oh, is somebody having some trouble getting wet? Is that why you got the KY jelly? <laughs> Everybody just mind you. What is? There's a level that is too far. We should all yes. be able to agree. There is a point where you like that shit was a little bit extra and you went further than you needed to go into Call of Duty. We could have just kept this to like, <laughs> oh, I love rotisserie chickens. That's a good yes, one. That's a good one. I prefer you not to do that, but that's that's fine. <laughs> if you're like, oh, you know, they got these on sale. I I'm I'm down with that too. I don't mind that. But goddamn, bro, we don't we not becoming intimate friends over this. 
<laughs> now I got to see your ass again next time I come in here and I'm a, I am got to hope another register open because I never want to see you again. <laughs> right. The only good thing that came out is, and I think it's because she knew she went too far. She did give me a senior discount. She did. Uh, I thought she was joking about it. Me too. But she said, I'll give you a senior discount. Uh, and she said, uh, because she loves love, and she says, obvious that uh, my wife is in love with me and that it, she loves seeing couples in love and all that. And I said, yeah, that's cool. But if this would have been my motherfucking side chick, I still want my 10% off. Okay, <laughs> don't. You you the one. You could have gave me the 5% and just assumed all that head cannon shit for yourself. Next time I come in, I want it again. If you ask me too many questions, that's some bullshit. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was my bad. <laughs> and I was just smiling. I was like, yes, I do love him. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't know help. P. Diddy be wanting the body. And you got to tell him no. no. It's like, like music. Music. All right. So, of course, there's still Diddy news because, god damn, every motherfucking day. All right. All right. Uh, Amazon explains why it removed the Kim Porter memoir. Yes, they removed it. Uh, which, I mean, come on. So they removed it. It said, we were made aware of a dispute regarding this title and have notified the publisher the book is not currently available for sale in our store. Good. Um, yeah, and that's because her family put out, like her kids and all this stuff, put out like a, a post basically saying like, this this shit is not true. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hurtful and the rumors are false and there's already so much shit happening. Like, it's people dealing with the outcome of this and you making fucking fake names and bullshit. Yeah, and that's the thing about, you know, this whole thing of us fascinated, being fascinated by rumors, gossip, and amusement and just looking at it as content and comedy. I can't think of a more evil thing. I mean, obviously not, you know, not Count Diddy in this situation, but I can't think of a more evil thing to do than what that white man did. Child, not trying to be funny. I would be pissed. Something yeah, happened to I mean, my family member. You're writing a fucking fake ass book. It doesn't even have to be my family. I'm pissed. I'm pissed. That's a fucked up thing that man did. Pretending to be black, got busted being black. Now he's doing interviews where he's probably getting paid to do the fucking interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made money off of the fucking book. It's got typos and spelling errors in it. It really capitalized off the sensationalistic uh, uh, environment that we live in where everybody's constantly just making content out of shit that's not really about content that's involving real people. Right. And and he capitalized on that shit. And he's, he's you know, and people are still seeing it as like sharing it and still acting like this shit was, is just part of the story. Like it's really disgusting what he did. Uh, Wendy Williams reacted to Diddy's arrest and said about time. Now, what's interesting is that people know Wendy Williams and going through a struggle with, like, you know, dement- early onset dementia or something. Mm-hmm. The fact that she still remembers or just had this moment, this lucid moment of being able to, like, like pull this out and be like, yeah, I still remember how fucked up he was. That's wild. Right. Um, so, yeah, she said, um, I had so many people tell me, Wendy, you called it. She told the Daily Mail. Even my only my own family said the same thing. Uh, to see this video of Cassie being pummeled, it was just horrific. But now you have to wonder how many times did this happen? How many more women were victims? It's just so terrible. And that's that's uh, Wendy Williams not doing um, no jokes. Yeah, that like she's not laughing about this or being funny about it. Like she just, um, you know, she's just keeping it, telling it like it is. Um, and then the last thing is this. There are commercials, ads, and hotlines launched for victims to sue Diddy over abuse allegations. Oh, Tony Busby. I was like, you know, I saw his phone number back there, and I was like, don't laugh about this shit. I know it feels like an ambulance chaser. But, yeah, people seeing but that, Tony they Busby, calling in. He's, he really does get the job done. Um, And so, uh, yeah, there's an abuse helpline. And when you have 120 people that are, you know, 
who had the backgrounds checked and credible enough for Tony Busby to bring to to bring to bear in this lawsuit. Oh, there's more. That that's just a fact. Like it's not like it's oh 120 and that's it. Um. So yeah, this is a part of a part of a broader effort by legal teams to assist victims in seeking justice and hold the music icon accountable. The hotline is known as the Sean P. Diddy Abuse Helpline. Uh, provides a direct way for individuals to report abuse and discuss potential legal cases with professionals. Um. So yeah, this I mean, this man is allegedly such a prolific abuser that they're basically doing the like Camp Lejeune. Yeah, how they had a massive right. And I think we got that because we we was uh, uh students at Fairville State. It was like, oh, you was in this area during this time? I don't know. I think a lot of people get it. I see it on the I oh. when if I watch daytime TV, there's commercials with it. Oh, okay. It's just a mass lawsuit thing, and you just want to make as many people aware as possible to be like, it's uh, they do the same thing for like talcum powder and shit to be like, yo, they this do. shit caused cancer. Y'all, if you ever used it. You might be into some money. You might can get mm-hmm. compensated. Let us know. So, yeah, it's it's just it's wild that it, that that this is happening. But I but what does that say about the amount of people that have allegedly been abused by this man? Uh, true. Um. All right. Let's see. Oh, my girl L Boogie, Lauren Hill. Mm-hmm. She's back in the news. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I gotta play the transition music. Sorry, I forgot. We out of the Diddy segment. We not we not trying to uh, do that no more. Uh, <laughs> All right, Lauren Hill uh, spoke up on that prize shit um, because she's like, um, "Uh, uh-uh, you're not finna do this to me, prize." So she said, "I understood that prize was under duress because of his legal battles, and that this is perhaps affecting his judgment, state of mind, and character." And then she laid out the facts. She got seven facts. You know, she loves seven. Seven is number completion. Okay. Okay. She's still a hotel. Uh, fact one, prize was advanced payment for our tour and failed to repay loans Lauren gave him out of goodwill. The 2023 tour was always meant to celebrate the miseducation of, of Lauren Hill's 25th anniversary right. with or without the the Fugees. So this was going to be a tour to celebrate the miseducation. That's, that's what that's I That's why the whole Fugees thing is kind of an afterthought. They were really, because honestly, that album is so good and that people will go out and still be disappointed she shows up three hours late. That's how good that fucking album was. Mm-hmm. If you The Fugees going on tour is not the same. Mm-hmm. No offense to the Fugees. I like their albums too, but it, getting the people to go out to that is a lot higher of an ask. Right. Number two, fact two, the Fugees were included in the tour because Proz needed money for his legal defense. So, I, like, this is charity at this point. Number three, Prize received three a $3 million advance for the tour to pay his legal fees. Lauren and Wyclef deferred their advances to help him out. And Lauren covered most of the tour expenses herself. Prize hasn't repaid the money and is in breach of their agreement. And he's suing her. Damn. Number four, Lauren handed, handled most of the tour's production and Prize just had to perform. Well, we all knew that. That's what you I told, said. I told y'all. Somebody t- wrote on Twitter, oh, y'all did Prize wrong. Nigga, I know what I'm talking about. Prize is a just show up guy. They not, no one's, I'll tell you what. Without, without looking it up, without Googling, spit a Prize verse right now. I, 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 I wait. That's what I thought. Number five, Prize thanked Lauren for saving his life during the last tour, and she's got receipts. Uh, Fact number six, Lauren didn't want to respond earlier out of respect for their friendship, but Prize's lawsuit pushed her to speak up. Number seven, Lauren made it clear she had nothing to do with Prize's legal troubles and isn't responsible for the decisions that led him here, even though she tried to help him. 
Prizes to Lauren for fraud, breach of contract, and more. But her response shows there's a lot more to the story than he's claiming. That's all the, they wrote. But mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And this is why this, I hate this way that shit has happened lately where the person that tries to be the bigger person, the more reasonable person, the more understanding person, they always be the one that everybody assumes the worst of. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying there's not reasons to be like, well, you know, Lauren be inconsistent. That's different than she fucking stole the the money and canceled the tour that that that, that prize was looking forward to all this shit from. And I, I'm like, come on. The, the reason he's not consulted is because he just shows up. And all of us know that. Anyway. Um, there's more for the election news as well. Okay. Give me running against Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. This former president, we're not going back. This former president, we're not going back. This former president, we're not going back. So let's be clear about that. Give me running against me. Running against me. Kamala Harris. All right. Election news. Um... The the first and funny one. Uh, Let's go with the funny one first. This nigga RFK Jr. is back in the news. What? Yeah. 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 Joke of a candidate. Um, (laughs) At least three women are claiming to have had romantic relationships with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in just the last year as he pursued a long shot bid for the presidency. Child, surely never coming back. Was all these three women sending unsolicited titty pics to you, fam? Mm-hmm. Was they pouring hunting you down too? All of them was. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. You a wild boy, right? Just that, that worm in his brain wasn't stopping nothing from downstairs. Uh, people close to Kennedy now feel the revelation of those alleged relationships could jeopardize his standing in Donald Trump's orbit, particularly as the former president and the 2024 Republican nominee fights to win over suburban women. Hey, man. Hey, 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 God. Hey. Come here. Listen. Listen. If it's any woman who's willing to vote for Trump, I promise you RFK Jr. having affairs is not the deal breaker. I no, it is not. Okay. It, it, the, the man who is uh f- convicted in civil court of sexual assault, the man that is a fucking felon, the man grab Mr. Grab him by the pussy. Right. <laughs> the nigga that was riding shotgun on Jeff Epstein plane going to the island. Hey man, them women. Is a lost cause. They voting in for a penny, in for a pound. Yes, sir. The only way they not voting is because of abortion. But it ain't because they find anything in his moral character to be lacking enough for them to go. I can't vote for this man. Agreed. They just thought he was fucking that lo- that other woman. I don't. Even, I don't even remember her name. Mm-mm. Damn, they be having people in and out of there like motherfucking. When I worked at McDonald's. Yeah, I don't ask me. You know, I don't know who. It, was, it started with an L. Laura Loomer. Is that right? I feel like that's right. Laura Loomer, they like they have more turnover than McDonald's. Like the way that it just, and not, that's not even a pun on the t- uh, Apple turnovers. I mean, they have more turnover, meaning like <laughs> motherfuckers be on the plane, they put in their two week notice. Next thing you know, they on Twitter talking shit about them. That's just crazy. Two sources with direct knowledge of the three women's accounts confirmed the media the existence of their claims. The me- media also reviewed and obtained text from a woman in which she detailed an alleged relationship with Kennedy this year. The three now the fact that this man is still getting so many women is that's what's really disturbing to me. Don't he do them videos where he be all cut up? He he does push ups and stuff, but he he also talk like that, right? I mean, look, y'all like it. I love it. I don't know what it takes to get a woman. I'm mm-hmm. not a woman. Maybe it, maybe it's people listening to this show like, I love motherfucking RFK Jr. Give me that worm, you know, in the brain and the every, other places. Like, maybe that's what people is into. I, I, some, look, it's not for men to tell women what to like. I don't know. Maybe y'all like this shit, but this motherfucker is knocking women down left and right. This dude. <laughs> Like a dick of cards, Mister Steal Your Girl. <laughs> That's crazy. 
Uh, the three women who know Kennedy through children's health defense and anti-vaccine group he chairs have been sharing their alleged experiences and text messages with others in the wake of the scandal. Anti-vaccine group. Yeah. Well, if you're anti-vaccine, are y'all also like anti, uh, like, do y'all not get STD tests? Like, I mean, you're anti-vaccine. I wouldn't see why you would get tested for anything else. What other viruses are y'all <laughs> right, just, just, just fucking around just with, breathing in each other face. <laughs> Y'all like, don't give me the HPV vaccine. That's nah. That's how they get you. Mm -hmm. Nah, just give me the HPV. I'll take my chances. Okay, Jenny McCarthy has said, a Kennedy spokesperson, a Kennedy spokesperson denied in a statement that to media that he has had any romantic relationships outside of his marriage to actress Cheryl Hines. Check this story is untrue. Mr. Kennedy has no romantic relationships with any woman other than his wife since their marriage. Child, she done took that ring and threw it off the top of a mountain wherever she at. I just want to know what did the person that the the what is it the spokesperson from inside the campaign? What did they sound like? Because I got a feeling they said this story is untrue. Mr. Kennedy has had no romantic relationships with any woman other than his wife since their marriage. And they was like, okay, uh, well, can I get your name again? <laughs> I'm just a campaign staffer. I'm just having to work on uh, New York place. <laughs> Nuzzy on leave at the season. We already know she did that. And now she's fighting with her ex. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is my favorite quote. One of the sources who spoke with media I said the scandal swirling over Kennedy and the relationship with Nuzzy is seen internally as an issue the campaign wants to stay as far away from as possible, particularly given Trump's own history of womanizing. Trump is concerned. He's concerned that there are more women and that more affairs will come out. Right now, they are waiting to see if the news cycle will blow over, but it won't, which has Trump reconsidering Bobby's values. Mr. Stormy Daniels? <laughs> is reconsidering values Mr. Mushroom Penis himself right. I know he ain't talking that is crazy boy ah oh, what a country we live in the fact that the polls are still 50 50 is doesn't make any sense to me we are hopelessly in a fucked up country um oh presidential debate vice presidential debate we saw it last night uh I watched it um uh, I was actually underwhelmed by uh, Governor Wall's uh, tactics and approach to the thing. Um, I think J.D. Vance, of course, just got there and lied, and he may have done it quickly and smoothly, but it was still lies, and um, they weren't really fact-checking them. They don't really only fact-check them like on one thing, the Haitian thing, and he went, I thought we were agreed to no fact-checking, and then they let him get on another live for like another minute. Um, he definitely did that flooding the zone thing where Tim Walls could not answer his own. Uh, he had to pick. And this is what happened to Biden, too. He had to pick between do I address how many lies this man just told or do I answer your question with here? Like, here's my plan. Here's our plans. Or whatever. Uh, J.D. Vance just did a lot of like, well, Kamala Harris, if she got all these plans, she should just do them now. So she's the vice president. Meanwhile, neither one of them talked about what plan they would initiate as president, as vice president, because we all know vice presidents don't get to do the legislation. Right. They get they get assigned things. They're spokespeople, but they're there if the president can't do the job. They're not right. fucking there to be like, it is the the Joe Biden uh, Affordable Care Act. That's never happened in the history of presidents. So we know that's bullshit. But he essentially kept doing that over and over. Dumb people will fall for it. Um, my main issue with walls is that, and I understand there are people that's going to disagree. I know y'all feel trepidation and the same way I did after Biden. Like I like it's very it's a protective feeling of like don't say anything bad. What if this means something bad gonna happen? I'm not saying anything bad about Walls. I'm not saying he lost the debate. I literally think an idiot would say he lost the debate. Anyone who's informed of the issues would not. And at the same time, I can go, I didn't like the conciliatory tone 
where they both were congratulating each other all the time for having a conversation and pointing out these these axes of agreement. Because what I think that does is it legitimizes J.D. Vance, who's a fucking monster. And I don't think it is good to be like, well, me and uh, J.D., we agree on this, and then go into where, like, I don't think that, I, I, I'm i sure that it assuaged some white folks. I'm sure there are some people that just want to see the good old days where we were bipartisan and everybody got along. These issues are too important. And when one person is on stage fundamentally lying, I do not need to hear you say, well, we agree on this. I don't need, because what you make it sound like is they were telling the truth, but I just disagree on like some tactics. It makes it seem as if you're confirming his lies, that you're accepting them as a premise to which you can have a spirited conversation. Um, and I really, the real, and the real big thing for me is that um, on the campaign trail, Walls is an attack dog. Yes. He's one of the reasons we be calling him weird. He be making jokes about the couch. Mm-hmm. So to tell me you shouldn't have expected that in this in, in this debate, I got to wholeheartedly disagree with you. I don't think my expectations were too high or crazy. I expected him to to be a little bit more chippy towards him because J.D. Vance is a liar. And if you let him just lie smoothly, it makes it seem like y'all both are on this weird equal footing. Once again, Smart people should not be taken in. I don't, I said it, as I said yesterday, I don't think this changes anything mm -hmm. percentage wise for who votes, how, and when. Agreed. I think JD Vance is still a very, he's going to be the least, have the lowest approval rate of any of the four people to hit the stage, period. Mm -hmm. Or five people, honestly. Um, so um, it's not that I'm worried or anything, but I think his tactic was a little flawed. And I would have liked to see him do a little bit more of, you said, this now you're saying that does america america i need y'all to know so when he gets up here like the, the 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 place where he got him was the end at the very end that last 10 minutes or so that was what i wanted to see the whole debate okay but when he points out like when he put him in a corner and said will you certify the election like would you have certified that election you said you would you wouldn't have certified the election that donald trump lost will you admit that he lost the election and jd vance kept avoiding the the point and then i think he said that's a damning non-answer and that was the line of the debate for me because the other shit was all weird gotcha shit it was like you know tim walls you misspoke one time what about that look at uh, if i'm saying i misspoke if i'm saying that wasn't accurate then, then that's the end of it. There's no, there's not a gotcha there to me. Right. It's just you're looking for an awkward TV moment. But there were so many moments where JD Vance just straight up lied about either shit he said. He said Donald Trump handed over power peacefully on January 20th. Well, January 6th. What the, no, he said January 20th, meaning the, oh. the actual day of the inauguration where Donald Trump left Washington. Oh, yeah, he didn't even show up. Right. I, and Tim Walls didn't, you know, nail him on those type of things, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is hard to do when a motherfucker's lying a lot and they're doing it in such a, like, stone face. But personally, I I felt like it, it missed the mark, and I wish he would have brought more of that kind of shit up. January the 6th fucked me up so bad. You said January the 20th. I was like, who that bitch? Who's January the 20th? You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, what are we talking about here? And so... It was peaceful. He's the only president that didn't show up, like like doing this transition. So no, it wasn't peaceful. That's what I'm saying. It's just uh, there were just too many moments where he could have just nailed JD Vance with things JD Vance had said already, mm -hmm. um, and he didn't spend any time really doing that. And like if he wouldn't have hit that last ten minutes, which I did, I did say when I looked at the topics, I was on Twitter live tweeting it. And I said. Um, looking at the topic choice, I said the walls is going to end strongly, and I think because people were feeling like oh, he's not going hard enough. But I was just looking, you just look at the topic choice, and you're like, oh, wait, they're not bringing up uh abortion, 
Like, so at some point they have to bring that up. I prefer now I'm I, I understand there's some varied points like people say you should bring up all that stuff at the top because people tune out as the debate goes on. I personally feel like you should bring up some of these more hard hitting things near the end because that will the tone the end of the debate is really the tone of the debate. Right. Unless you flub it so fucking bad in the beginning like Biden did, the end of the debate is where people go because then you immediately go into coverage and then the coverage is what's the last thing we saw very rarely is the coverage like let's go all the way back to two hours ago remember when he said this is normally like what was the last statement what was the last gaffe what was the last disagreement so i felt like that ending of like going from like abortion to uh election the election fraud voter suppression immigration i felt like those were things that i knew walls would do a good job on mm -hmm. But yeah, in general, I was a bit underwhelmed, you know. Yeah, and it was almost like they were trying to, from what I seen, like everybody was just trying to be nice to each other. Yeah, you know, and shit like that. Versus, being yeah, it was a lot of like we don't want. According to people that thought that that was a good job, it was this idea of like we need to get these niche voters, these white middle Americans who might swing over to Harris and walls but they're just too afraid but he'll 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 talk their language he'll be like no we agree all on right. that and school shootings hey we all we don't want kids dying right you know that kind of shit and so maybe it did work but the problem with that is it's on my tv too everybody right so if you just did something that resonates with this elusive white voter that has not broken for Democrats since the Civil Rights Act passed. Right. I get to say, yeah, I felt like this shit wasn't for me. And in that way, it did not seem good. That's all. Yeah, and it seemed very boring, which it which is which is yeah, what I expected. I'm okay with it being boring. Mm -hmm. The boring thing needs to happen more. We we've lost our fucking minds thinking that this Trump shit is okay. Right. This, this shit is not okay. We need to go back to boring ass debates for serious people. Yes. <laughs> we should not allow motherfuckers to scream about cats and dogs and go viral and make memes and laugh about it. I that, agree. That's not a, that is not something that is tenable. Um, so I'm okay with them sitting up. That is an old style debate. Two white men it on was. stage politely disagreeing and one lying like shit. That is like pretty much every major debate I've seen in my lifetime that's closer to normal than the shit we've let happen with Trump uh, and the last thing on Trump bombshell immunity filings uh, filing details Trump's alleged increasingly desperate bid to overturn the 2020 election so special counsel Jack Smith who is in the I believe the documents case who has I, uh, I think uh, I think Eileen Cannon is his judge the one that's they Bullshit. keep saying it's, it's in over her head and mm -hmm. I say it's mm -hmm. in on the take yeah, she's purposely doing this shit. So uh, she unsealed his um, uh, the de some of the details of his filing, um, which is something that the Trump uh, lawyers were intentionally trying to stop. Oh, okay. Because it goes into more details with a little bit more damning evidence and a little bit more uh, specific allegations that show the criminality in it right so um it basically they got they got the um they had to i believe refile it after the immunity ruling that the supreme court did um and so now uh the filing says trump intentionally lied to the public state election officials and his own vice president in an effort to clean the power at the losing election while privately describing some of the claims of election fraud is crazy uh, pr prosecutors allege in a 165 page filing when the defendant lost the 2020 presidential election he resorted to crimes to try to stay in office with private co-conspirators the defendant launched a series of increasingly desperate plans to overturn the legitimate election results in seven states that he had lost when Trump's effort to overturn the election through lawsuits and fraudulent electors failed to change the outcome of the election prosecutors allege the former president fom fomented violence with prosecutors 
describing Trump as directly responsible for the tinderbox that he purposely ignited on January 6th. Mm -hmm. The defendant also knew that he had only one hope, last hope to prevent Biden's certification as president, the large and angry crowd standing in front of him. So for more than an hour, the defendant delivered a speech designed to inflame his supporters and motivate them to march on the Capitol, to the Capitol. I, I agree. The lengthy filing, which includes an 80 page summary of the evidence gathered by investigators, outlines multiple instances in which Trump allegedly heard from advisors who disapproved his allegations. I mean, who disproved his allegations. Yet he continued to spread his claims of the outcome determinative voter fraud. It doesn't matter if you won or lost the election, you will still have to fight like hell, he allegedly told members of his family following the 2020 election. In a statement, Trump campaign spokesperson Stephen Chung said the release of the filing was an attempt to interfere with the upcoming election following Tuesday's vice presidential debate. So now they're like, y'all interfering with the election by letting by, by this filing being released. But they didn't release it. The judge allowed it to go out. Yeah, I see. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It was Judge Tanya Chutkin that did it. Okay, not Eileen Cannon. I was going to say that wouldn't make sense. She wouldn't do that. And her order allowing the redacted filing to become public U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin who has been overseeing the case, addressed the defense uh, accusations of partisan bias. Defendants' opposition brief repeatedly accuses the government of bad faith partisan bias. These accusations, for which defendant provides no support, continue a pattern of defense filings focused on political rhetoric rather than addressing the legal issues at hand. Not only is that focus unresponsive and unhelpful to the court, but it is also unbefitting of the experienced defense counsel and under the undermining of the judicial proceedings in this case future filing should be directed to the issues before the court yeah she's the one that don't play because yeah. i think she's the one that said i'm not slowing the trial down because of the election it, it we're going at the same speed like you want to run president run president but you're not going to make me not do my job as a judge right um so yeah is i mean and there's like actual um quotes that I saw too um, let me go to Twitter real quick and uh, find my boy uh, Debbie uh, dropping dropping knowledge on the shit uh, yeah my man Kyle Griffin he be uh, coming through with the quotes um, so there's, there's uh, all kinds of quotes in this um, and some of them are just so fucking I mean, they're just bananas, but they're not something you wouldn't believe. Okay. Right. Um, so uh let's see. He extensively used private actors in his campaign infrastructure to attempt to overturn the election results and operated in private capacity as a candidate for office. Um working with a team of private co-conspirators, the defendant acted as a candidate when he pursued. So that they keep pointing out candidate. Because what they're trying to say is this was not a function as president. Right. This was him running for president and privately trying to grease the wig, like for his private benefit, trying to overturn the election. Because the Supreme Court ruling was like, well, if he does something, you know, as in his role as president, how can we say that's a crime? And he's like, because if he does a crime to get reelected, that's a that's a candidate crime. Right. Um, yeah. What was the one where it says? Um, oh, yeah. OK, so they said privately, the defendant told advisors, including they redact some names, campaign personnel and a White House staffer and volunteer and the vice president chief of staff. That is such that in such a scenario, he would simply declare victory before all the ballots were counted and any winner was projected. Publicly, the defendant began to plant seeds for this false declaration, and months leading up to the election, he refused to say whether he would accept the election results, insisting that he could lose the election only because of fraud, falsely. Um, there's also a point where, yeah, they asked him about Mike Pence's safety, because they said, you know, this you made a Twitter post that um, focused on uh, that focused the January 6 mobs like anger towards Mike Pence. And they said, you know, this could jeopardize his safety. He said, so what? You're goddamn right. He that, did not care about that man. That's according to uh new to grand jury testimony that's newly mm -hmm. been um yeah. you know that man ain't got a man, he don't have a spine nor a backbone, but he was like, I'm voting for Kamala Harris and I don't blame him. Yep. 
Uh, Trump campaign employee uh, when presented with information at a Detroit tabulation facility that a final batch would heavily favor Biden. This is what was happening in these black areas that was like, yeah, when they when these black people's votes come in, you're going to find out that you lost the state. And he said, find a reason that it isn't. Give me options to file litigation. When the colleagues suggested that there was about to be unrest reminiscent of the Brooks Brothers riot, which is a violent effort to stop the vote count in Florida after the 2000 presidential election. I've seen the documentary on that. Very scary. They were literally banging on the glass at the facility with people. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. I remember that. Had them people in there fucking frightened to death. Right. Yes. Well, the uh, person five, not the president, but just a person that worked for the president, responded, make them riot, do it. Yeah. So this is the same guy's like, I don't know how, what, this, this is crazy to me too. Uh, like this, this is what he does. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 I don't find any of this to be revelatory and like what but it's more like a of course of course and i hope people that you know keep shitting on jack smith and merrick garland understand what they were up against like this is what the fuck they're alleging in these documents this is not some milly mouth middle of the road shit that they're saying they're like this motherfucker tried to steal the election and it's right. a crime right and and my thing is this and I will continue to say this, and I meant it from the beginning, take your time. Because everybody kept fussing and hollering and screaming about why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so long? Why is everything moving so slow? Why we have a new person? Bitch, it takes time. Because I feel like this, if you're going to shoot, you need to shoot with the best ammunition that you have. Don't fuck around. Shoot early and miss because y'all are too impatient. Yeah, I, I mean, you have to put the most powerful case you can. And, of course, he's just going against a rig, a stacked deck. You got right. Eileen Cannon. You got the Supreme Court uh, signaling that they're not going to hold this man accountable. It's not easy. And a lot of this is because motherfuckers slept at the wheel in 2016. Um, and so we got to deal with this rigged environment that makes it almost impossible to hold this man accountable. But that doesn't mean Jack Smith and Merrick Garland are not going to do the damnedest that they can. Right. Like, just because you're on Twitter and it's all easy to fucking tweet, tweet the shit Agreed. doesn't mean it's easy to make the filings work. Mm -mm. Uh, the defendant once again told Pence I think you have the power to decertify when Pence was unmoved the defendant threatened to criticize him publicly. I'm going to have to say you did a great disservice. Essentially th that's the threat. Like you know what that means. You know who's gonna come after you. Like I'm like, you know who gonna have it, they gonna have the gallows outside for your ass. Um, so yeah, he tried to pressure him numerous times. Mike Pence and uh and, and Pence wouldn't move. Um, something that JD Vance would absolutely move. He would do it. Mm hmm Um Yeah, so oh, so he was elected. Yeah. I mean selected, I'm sorry. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh that's that Trump news shit. Uh, all right, hour and a half. I think we should wrap it up. I don't think. What, what else did I have? You have anything else? A lot of you want to talk about or hit on? Um, not really. I think we can get rid of this article. Yeah. All right. Let's do sword ratchetness and then wrap it up, everybody. Okay. We got we got dinner plans tonight, so I'll go ahead and get off of here and edit this show and get it up mm -hmm. um, let's see where's my there we go <laughs> to admit to teaming up in a sword attack that cut off Riverside homeless man's hand Oh, two people who cut off the hand of a homeless man in a sword attack in Riverside are awaiting sentencing after pleading guilty to mayhem. Uh, uh, Stephen Daniel Dillard, 39, was jailed without the possibility of bail after pleading guilty on September 13th to one count of mayhem and admitting sentencing enhancements that include using a weapon while committing a felony and committing a crime of great violence or callousness. Antier Tajon Lottie who is not in custody, pleaded guilty to one count of mayhem. Dillard sliced off one of the victim's hands as Lottie held him. 
What kind of Walking Dead shit is this? And why isn't he in jail too? Right. You hold people down to get their hands cut off. Honestly, you you in, you, you 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 in too. <laughs> you this. Whatever they get charged with, you getting charged with too. Yeah, both are scheduled to be uh sentenced on October 24th. Uh, the crime happened May 13, 2023. Dilla had been in an ongoing dispute with the victim, whose first name is Jeffrey, a man in his 60s. Dilla and Lottie got into a physical altercation with Jeffrey, and Dilla sliced off one of Jeffrey's hands. Riverside police responded to the area where the hand was found. Police arrested Dilla 10 days later. It was unclear when Lottie was arrested. Oof. Jeffrey was treated at the hospital, but the hand could not be reattached. Oh. Uh, Jeffrey was known in the downtown area. Michelle Lopez, general manager of at Chiba Hut, Described Jeffrey as sweet, helpful, polite, and said that he came into the shop regularly and helped with tasks in exchange for food. Damn. I don't know what kind of street justice shit that is, but uh no. That's 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 too much. Yes, that is. Go to the jail. Yeah, go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Mm. That is foolishness. And I you do not foolishness. It. Stop it. A sword did not help in any way. Mm. <laughs> This is stupid. This is absolutely ridiculous. Get! Get out of here! Get out of here! We are adults, and this is ridiculous. Cut the crap. Cut the crap. Not the hand. That's my girl. Cut the crap, not the hand, okay? That's the official <laughs> yes, motto. Yes, cut the crap, not the hand. All right, y'all. We'll be back Saturday for feedback. Hope you enjoyed these episodes this week. They were less segmented and more talky yes. than normal. But uh, we had a good time, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Until next time, I love you. I love you too. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Appreciate y'all stopping.